Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. Today I've got a message prepared for you that I hope will be as evangelistic as possible. Amen? I really want to see people get saved. That's the thrust of my ministry, preaching the gospel of salvation. And if you remember last week, we looked at salvation testimonies. And I sat out in the yard and sat in the little swing. And I just read you many testimonies from 2019 and then up to, oh, what was it, April of 2020. And uh, all these testimonies of salvation, people have gotten saved from this ministry, from my preaching and teaching on YouTube. And so I said, well, it was a blessing. A lot of people left their testimonies below. And that was a blessing as well. But uh, I have my testimony of salvation. I've given it before on YouTube. And I encourage people who are saved to share their testimony. But I also want to make sure that their testimonies line up with Scripture. Amen? We should always make sure that what we believe and teach lines up with this book, the King James Bible. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach a message entitled, Things People Add to Salvation. Because salvation is so simple. Let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'll read a couple of verses here before we get started. But I want to show you how there are people out there that try to add something to salvation. And you can't do it. You're saved through Christ, through His blood, through His finished work, through what He's done, through His atonement. You're not saved by what you do. But a lot of people, they think, oh, well, it's not enough what Jesus did. i got to do something. And they attempt to add to salvation and make it not faith alone today in our dispensation. They try to make it faith and something else. Or they teach pure works and they say it's only by works, it's not by what Jesus did. Well, that's one of the greatest blasphemies the world's ever known because that's saying what Jesus did on the cross is meaningless. It's nothing. Jesus died for nothing. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. So salvation is simple. And Paul calls it simple. Paul calls salvation simple. But Paul, the apostle, also warns of those who would attempt to change the gospel and get people in their minds to think that they're saved by something other than the gospel. So let's begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'll begin reading there in verse 2. Chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now verse 3 says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul says, One of my fears is that people would sneak into the church and start preaching another gospel. And uh, that's not what he wanted. He wanted the true gospel. He said salvation is simple. The simplicity that is in Christ. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at the Bible and what the Bible says, what the Bible teaches about salvation. Salvation by faith alone today. Because today we're saved only by faith. We're not saved by faith plus something else. If you try to add any work to your salvation then you're nullifying what Jesus did to save you. You cannot say salvation is by faith in Jesus and this one little thing. One old preacher said it like this. He said, if you're trying to add one drop of your own works to salvation, then you're not saved. Because it's not what you do and this one little thing you do to help Jesus save you. No, you're saved by Jesus alone. So let me write this up here, and I want you to get a hold of this and see this, that what you have in this world today is you have true Bible believers that believe the Bible and believe what it teaches. And the Bible teaches that salvation today is by faith alone. And it's faith in this shed blood. So salvation is by faith alone today. Not by any works that we do. But there are people out there that try to say, no, 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 uh, that's not true. And they say, and a lot of them try to get you back under the Old Testament law, so I'm going to put them on this side. A lot of them say, no, it's by your works that you get to heaven. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, well, then you'll get to heaven when you die. And God will say, good job. But that's not the Bible teaching. Matter of fact, the Bible says a lot against that and the opposite of that. That's not salvation. But these people, I like to say they say it like this. These people believe in a gospel of pure works. They say it's through your works that you get saved. Well, that's a false teaching. It's not by our works that we get saved. But then you have people on an other extreme that teach that salvation is by faith 
and works. And so they say salvation is by faith and works. I, I, I like to say it like this. They believe that it's by salvation by faith plus works. And so they add to your salvation. And they say, now you've got to do this to get saved. Yeah, you can believe in Jesus and that's okay. But that and something else. So you've got to have faith plus works. Now is that salvation? No, that's not salvation today. We're not saved by faith and works. We're saved by faith alone. So what these are, is these are religion. These are uh, religion in nature. They are religion. And one of them is a religion that tells you you can get to heaven by your works, the pure works preachers. And the other is a religion that tells you, well, you can get saved by faith and something else. Or often they'll say, oh, you can get saved by faith, but then you've got to do good works or you'll lose it. They're, they're turning and twisting the gospel into something you do rather than what Jesus did for you, to save you. But this one is the only true one. This is salvation. Theirs is the teaching of a denomination or a cult or a sect. And we call them a religious sect or a cult that teaches this. This is a religion. And I don't want to be a part of a cult or a religious sect that teaches something that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, why do they teach this? Why do they not teach, hey, come to Christ and trust Him alone and His shed blood for salvation? Why do they say, no, you got to do this? Or you can believe in Jesus, that's fine, but then you have to do this. Why do they add works to salvation? Well, it's because they're not saved. Number one, that's probably number one reason. But also, number two, it's because they don't rightly divide. And when you rightly divide the word of truth, you understand God sent the Apostle Paul... And God gave to Paul the gospel. And so the gospel of salvation today is revealed to the Apostle Paul. And let's go there. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Let's start this thing out with the gospel. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. And I want to be a Bible believer and a Bible teacher who rightly divides the word of truth. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2, uh, 15, to rightly divide the word of truth. The workman is not to be ashamed. Rightly, don't. So you'll be ashamed unless you understand why Paul is in the Bible. And the reason that Paul is in the Bible is because God gave to him the gospel that saves us. Now, what is the gospel that saves us? Is it you're saved by pure works, by what you do? No. Is it by you're saved through faith and works? No. So it's not what you do that saves you. Let's look at what Paul says the gospel is. And I, I, I hate to mention people that attack me, but this is a great illustration of uh, one of the things they attack me on. There have been people all over YouTube making videos against Robert Breaker, and they go, well, that Robert Breaker fella, well, he preaches another gospel. <laughs> and I look, and I'm like, do what now? And so I try to find out what are they teaching, and they're either on this side or they're on that side, but they're not teaching the gospel. If you want to know what the gospel is, you go to the Bible and you look for the verse where it says, this is the gospel. And that's what I do. I go to the Bible, I go to where it says, this is the gospel, and guess what? It says right there, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, what the gospel is. And it says there that you're saved by this gospel. Let's go there, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. And yet, people have been sending me some videos on YouTube where people are like, Oh, we're making a video against Robert Breaker. Robert Breaker's not saved. Another one. He preaches another gospel. And I scratch my head and I go, Well, no, the gospel's right here. And it says that this is the gospel whereby you are saved. So, no, I don't teach another gospel. I simply go to where the Bible says the gospel is this, and I read it. And it says, By which you are saved. And then it says, if you keep a memory of what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. What does it mean to believe in vain? It means you believe that Jesus might have died on the cross, but you're not uh, appropriating that. You're not accepting that. You're not trusting completely in that. You're trusting in something you do. There's a word for vain. It's called vanity. And vanity is self. So if you're believing in vain, well, that's the root word for vanity. You're believing in something you do. So right there in the gospel, it tells us that you're not saved by anything that you do. You're saved, rather, by believing in what Jesus did. Look what it says in verse 3 and 4. And see if there's works in here. See if there's anywhere here in the gospel that says, now you've got to do something to get saved. 
Verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. How did he die? Well, he shed his blood. See, the blood-stained gospel is all about the blood of Jesus and his sacrificial blood atonement to save us. It's all about his sacrifice, not our sacrifice. It's what he did for us. His sacrifice for our sins. So it's Jesus who died to save us, not us trying to die ourselves to save ourselves. So it says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So when you look at that, when you read that, you instantly understand that the gospel of salvation that saves us, by which you're saved, is a gospel of what Jesus did for man. So this is the gospel of what Jesus did. It's what he did for us, not what we do. But these people, they say, now you want to be saved, it's all about what you do. And so they preach a you-do gospel. Well, Paul didn't preach that. He preached a Jesus-did-it-all gospel. It's all about how Jesus paid for our sins. Now, this group over here, they say, yeah, 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 you can believe in Jesus, believe in that, that's great, but just make sure that you do something also. So there's something that you must do. And so they make it faith plus works, plus what you do. But I don't see that in the gospel. The gospel is not, now Jesus did this, do you believe that, and now you do this too to be saved. That's not what the gospel says. It's not what you do. It's whether or not you are trusting in what Jesus did for you. So the gospel of salvation is a gospel of it's all done. Now believe it. Their teaching is it's not done. You've got to keep doing it. You've got to do something to be saved. And over here, it's, got to, it's got to, something you've got to keep doing. You see how they're adding to the gospel and trying to tell you that you have to do something? Is salvation by works? Well, let's look at some Bible verses, and let's define what a work is. You might ask, and I've had people ask this, what is a work, Robert Breaker? Okay, well, the only thing I know to do is go to the Scripture and let the Bible define itself. And the Bible does that. The Bible tells us that we're not saved by works, not by pure works, nor by faith plus works. We're saved by faith alone. Now, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we read, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by faith today, not by works. But I clearly see in these two verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, what the definition of a work is. Look at it again. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. So what is a work? It's something that you do of yourself. And then it says, it is the gift of God. So salvation is a free gift offered to you through Christ that you receive by faith. You, if, you, if you have to work for it, then it's not a gift. You work for something and you earned it. You don't earn salvation. God didn't say the way to heaven is to earn your salvation by works. He said, no, I offer you salvation as a free gift and you have it and you receive it by faith. All right, so I hope you see that. So salvation is through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works. So what is a work? Something that you do of yourself, and it's what? Lest any man should boast. Something that you can boast about. If you're on this side thinking, I'm getting to heaven because I'm a good person. Look at me, look at me, look how great I am. Then you're boasting. And you're trying to make God look at you and accept you based upon what you do. <laughs> that's pretty dumb. Because that's looking at Jesus and going, Whatever you did doesn't matter because you're nothing. I'm everything. It's all about me. <laughs> really? So you're basically saying Jesus died on the cross for nothing because he can't save you. That's sad. That's twisted. That's sick. That's perverted. And that's not the gospel. It's not what you do that saves you. But then you might be on this side. You might go, oh yeah, I know Jesus died. And yeah, I believe he did that and everything. But, but it wasn't enough what Jesus did. No, I got to keep doing something. I got to do this and that and the other thing, and I got to keep doing it, or else I'm going to die and go to hell. So, what are you doing? Well, you're on this side looking at the cross going, ha ha, Jesus, it wasn't enough what you did. No, I'll finish it. <laughs> You'll do what now? I'll finish it. 
No, when Jesus died on the cross, remember what he said? He said, it is finished. He didn't say, now let me save you, but you're only saved for a little while, so keep doing something to stay saved. No, he said, it is done. It is finished. Salvation is complete in Christ. It's not what we do that saves us. It's when we give up and come to Christ as a sinner and receive that free gift of eternal life through faith in what Jesus did for us. And we're once saved, always saved. We're eternally secure. We can't lose it. And it's not by our works. It's by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The finished work of Him. The finished work of Jesus. So that's salvation. And that's what I preached my whole ministry. I got saved on July 29th, 1992, when I finally understood that. 18 years old, but I'd been in many churches my whole life. And I heard either that message or that message but they never took me to that message, which is the right message, the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the message of salvation by faith only. So I'm so thankful that I got saved. A lot of people have been sending emails and writing and, and telling me, Brother Breaker, I got the message. I understood. For my life, I was in a cult. I was in a sect. I was in a lost religious denomination that taught a works gospel, either pure works or faith and works. But now I see it, and now I trust Christ alone. And they all say the same thing. And there's this peace, there's this rest in knowing that it's not what I do. I don't sit around like this with my finger crossed going, Oh, I sure hope God accepts me. Oh, I sure hope I'm doing enough to get to heaven. Oh, I hope I don't lose it. When you understand the true message of salvation, you're like, Whew, I know I'm saved. Now I know I'm on my way to heaven. Now I know Jesus saved me because he said he'd give me that free gift, and I got it. I got it. I have it by faith, and I'm saved. I'm resting in the finished work of Christ. So salvation is by faith. So a work defined in Scripture is something you do that you can boast about. So it's you thinking that you do something to get yourself to heaven, and that's not salvation. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is by what? Faith. Let's look at a couple verses real quick, and I want to go to as many verses as I can, but... For sake of time, I won't be able to go to all of them, but I want to go to some of the most powerful and important verses. In Romans chapter 3, verse 22, look what it says. Romans 3, 22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So it's by faith that we're saved. And when we're saved, God imputes to us His righteousness. And we're saved by grace through faith. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. It's not of works. It's through faith. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. God is speaking through Paul here. And in Galatians 3 26 we read, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When you're saved through faith in the gospel, faith in the precious shed blood atonement of Christ, then you are born again and you are a child of God, a son of God, it says in John 1 12. You don't become born again. You don't become a child of God by your works. You don't get saved by saying, well, I'm going to believe a little of Jesus, but a whole lot of me. And I'm just going to mix the two, and I'm going to believe that it, it, partly Jesus saves me, but mostly it's me doing something that keeps me saved. That's not salvation. You're not saved if you believe that. You have never become a child of God by faith. Now let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. So when you go through the scriptures and you read the Bible and you understand why Paul is in the Bible, and I don't have time to get into Paul, but Paul's in the Bible, and Paul's the one that teaches this. And it's for the church age in which we're in today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15, look at what it says. Paul's writing, and he says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So it's through the scriptures, it's through the Bible, that we are saved. Not through a denomination, not through what some man says. We're not saved because some guy says, well, if we do this, we'll get to heaven. You know, That's not salvation. You're not saved by what you do. You're saved when you trust in what Jesus did because the Bible clearly teaches, and there's supposed to be a Bible there, the Bible clearly teaches, well, it looks horrible, doesn't it? <laughs> but the Bible clearly teaches that you're saved through faith and what your faith is to be in. It's to be in the blood of Jesus, Romans 3.25, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So salvation is by faith, or by believing, or by trusting. Look at Romans 1.16. So you know what that means? 
That means, and I hate to say it, that the majority of people out there that claim to be Christians today are lost. Because the majority of your denominations in the world today are either on this side of the cross, believing that it's through works only that they're saved, or on this side of the cross, thinking that they're saved by faith plus works. And they're not here before the cross, trusting only in the finished work of Christ. That's sad. But that's a simple truth. Not everyone who says they're a Christian really is. What makes you a Christian is whether or not you are trusting in the blood of Christ alone to get you to heaven. If you're trusting in that or that, then you're trusting in you. And you're trying to get yourself to heaven. It won't work. Jesus said, I'm the door. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You can't get to heaven on your own. You have to come through Him. Imagine trying to get to heaven without Christ washing your sins away in His precious blood. No, you die, you go to hell because you're still in your sins. A lot of people think, well, if I did bad things in my life, so I'll just do a lot of good things. And if my good works, I'll obey my bad works. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You've still done the bad. You can't correct and, 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 and get rid of the bad. It's still there. Now it must be washed away. And the only way to have it washed away is receive the free gift through faith. So Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation through the blood of Christ, through faith, through the gospel. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So salvation is through faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now let's go to Ephesians 1.13 real quick. This is all to try to get to the message. Oh man, I'm 20 some minutes in. I haven't even got to the message yet. But Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And now notice what it says. In whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The only way to have your sins washed away through the blood of Jesus and to be sealed with the Holy Spirit is through receiving the free gift of salvation by faith. If you're one of those that's mindset is, no, 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 it's only through my works, then you are damned. You are lost. If you're one of those that says, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, but, oh, i got to do all these things or else I'm going to lose it and go to hell, then I hate to say it, but it's true, you're lost. Because you are adding works to the gospel. And the gospel is not of works, lest any man should boast. It's trusting fully in the blood of Christ. Now, after you're saved, yeah, you work for Jesus. You serve Him. But you're not working to get saved or to stay saved. You work because you are saved. But there's people that are on one side or the other. And it's sad, but they're lost. Now, with all that stated, there are people, there are denominations, which say, no, no, it's either works only, according to them, or it's faith plus works. And they both emphasize what you do to try to save yourself. But let's focus on this one today. This is what I want to preach against, is those who add to salvation. This is the side that add. These people here are adding something to the gospel. They're making it faith plus works. And it's not faith plus works. It's faith only. So they are adding. So I won't talk about this side uh, much. You know, this side, they're just wrong. <laughs> Trying to get to heaven based upon themselves. They're thinking, in my flesh, I can do something that will please God that will get me to heaven. You know what the Bible says? No. No flesh shall glory in His presence. You know what the Bible says? It says, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. You think you're going to make it to heaven based upon what you do? Without faith alone in the finished work of Christ, you're going to hell. I hate to say it, but that's just what the Bible teaches. It's not what you do in your flesh that gets you to heaven. So we know that this is a cult. We know this is wrong. But I want to talk about this side over here. And I've got seven points today. Um, and here's what I want to say. What they add to salvation. I'm going to have to put it way over here. What, I'll put it this way. What some add to salvation. So we're not going to be talking about this people. We're going to be talking about those people. These lost religious people who think, no, faith isn't good enough. No, I can't get to heaven just by faith. Why, well, i got to do something in order to get to heaven. They have a perverted gospel, and they're still lost. And that's sad. These people are lost. Just like over here, these people are lost. So let's look at seven things today, and I hope this will be a blessing to you because in the world in which we live, there are some people out there, and I hope you can see this. It looks almost like it went off the side of the 
of the video there. Yeah, they're barely still there. So, okay. There are people out there today that are part of a religious sect, part of a um, denomination that teaches a false gospel. And in their denomination, they add something, these people, to salvation. I'm going to give you seven different things that I've seen over the years in my ministry that they add to salvation and that they try to tell you you have to do in order to stay saved. That's how they, they say, oh, well, you can get saved through Jesus, but then you can lose it. So you have to stay saved based on what you do. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says once saved, always saved, because it says salvation is eternal life. If you could lose it, then it wasn't eternal. Eternal means forever. It's a free gift of being saved forever. That's what salvation is. If you preach that you can lose it, then you don't believe God. And you don't believe it's forever. You don't believe it's eternal. So you're calling God a liar. And you're thinking you're saved. And you're thinking you're saved, though, based upon what you do. So you're lost. You're trusting in your works. You're not trusting fully in the finished work of Christ. So the first thing I want to say is there are people that add to salvation, and they said, well, yeah, you can believe in Jesus. You know, yeah, yeah, trust in Jesus. That's great. But then, as long as you keep the law, you're saved. And so these people say you have to keep the law. Is that salvation? Is salvation trust Jesus and keep the law? The law was before Jesus. <laughs> We're not under the law today, according to Paul, at all. So let's look at some verses about that. There are people out there that say, well, you've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the law, because if you don't keep the law, well, you'll go to hell. And they believe in Jesus, they say. Many of them are your seven-day Adventists, and I've talked to many of them till I'm blue in the face. And they have a faith plus works gospel. And they think, oh, I can believe in Jesus but it's not enough to just believe if I don't keep the law, then he'll put me in hell. You have a false gospel. I'm sorry, but that's not salvation. Let me show you a couple verses that prove that they're wrong. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When you believe, you're saved. You're eternally secure in Christ. You can't lose salvation. And God has imputed his righteousness to you. You don't keep the law and thinking, if I keep the law, I'll go to heaven. That's not salvation. But that's what they do. They take the law and they take grace. And they say, let's just go ahead and mix them together. That's like trying to mix oil and water. They don't mix. It won't work. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. The Bible says right there, Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. We are not saved by keeping the law. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. And I want to read Galatians 2.16. And in Galatians 2.16, I don't see how you can make it any clearer than what Paul says in Galatians 2.16. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So it's not faith in Jesus and to keep the law. That's not it. It's faith only. So he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So if you belong to a denomination, and they're telling you that you have a part in salvation, and that if you don't keep the law, then you're going to go to hell, and they say, oh yeah, but we believe in Jesus, we call ourselves Christians, we love Jesus, we love Jesus, but keep the law or you're going to hell, you are in a cult that is preaching something foreign to what the Bible teaches. And they're lost. And they need to get saved. And that's so sad. That's so sad. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. I don't want them to go to hell. That's why I want to tell them the truth of the gospel. I want them here. Because here is salvation. That is damnation. Because that's saying, Jesus, what you did on the cross wasn't good enough. No, I'm going to help you save me. I'm going to do something. And what you did wasn't enough. No, what he did was enough. It's done. It's enough. Amen? What Jesus did. Jesus would have to die all over again every time someone sinned if what he did on the cross didn't forgive all sins. You think he's going to do that? Come back down? Live 33 more years every time and die on the cross every time someone sins? Well, he, he'd never have any rest. Let's go to Galatians 3.21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21 says, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, this is eternal life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. 
But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Let me write up here the word believe. Put it in a different color. Believe. It's through faith. It's through believing. It's through trusting that we're saved. Not through works. And then we continue there. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So you weren't saved by faith under the law. You had to keep the law. But now you're saved by faith. That's what he's saying. And then he says here, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So it's not the law that saves you. What are you doing trying to add to salvation and say, no, you've got to keep the law too? Verse 25, But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Schoolmaster is the law, so we're no longer under the law. I could go over and show you more verses, but I don't have time, where it says you are no longer under the law, but under grace. Uh, let's go to Romans 3.28 real quick for one more. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28 says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Say by faith without having to mix the law with faith. It's not the law that saves you, and it's not adding the law to the gospel that saves you. It's faith only, faith alone today that saves. Now, let's look at another one. There's other people out there that say, well, you know, yeah, the law is over. We're in the New Testament, not in the Old, and that's what the law was for the Old Testament. So, yeah, it's not keeping the law per se. It's just doing good works. So when you're saved, if you continue doing good works, then you're saved. But if you claim to be saved and you stop doing good works, this crowd says, well, then, then you can lose it. Is uh, that what the Bible says? Does the Bible say we're saved by faith, but then we can lose it based upon how we live after? Is it by faith and works? No, it's not. Let's look at some verses. We'll go to Titus. Well, first let's go to Romans. Since we're already there, Romans 4, 5. Then we'll go to Titus 3. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It, it's not saying after you're saved you shouldn't do good works. You should. We should do good works after we're saved. But the good works have nothing to do with our salvation. What we do has nothing to do with getting us to heaven. It's whether or not we come to Christ alone for salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. And I get so sad to see people out there with this false religious belief thinking that, oh, i got to do something to get to heaven. And they still miss Christ. They don't see Christ crucified and Him wanting to be their Savior. They want to save themselves. It'll never work. You cannot save yourself. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. And it continues on there. So it's by God's grace, through, through faith, through His mercy. His mercy is on the cross. His dying for, for our sins. He loved us this much as He spread His arms and He died in my place. And he paid for my sins with his own life, with his own blood. But there's people out there that say, no, 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 you see, it's, it's still faith in works. Well, are they right? No. No, they're not. They're completely wrong. They're adding works to salvation. And it's not works that saves. Then there's others out there that will add repentance. And they say, well, you know, repentance is what saves. And then you believe. So... Instead of saying it's faith and works, they kind of get a little bit over here and they say it's repentance and faith. So they don't say it's by pure repentance that you're saved. They say repent and believe. So they're adding a work here. And what they're doing is the way they define repent and repentance makes it a work. Now, I've met this crowd, and I've run into this crowd a lot. Many of them are your um, lordship salvationists. Many of them are, are people that don't understand how to rightly divide. They'll take you way over to Jesus' ministry, and Jesus is talking to Jews, and all the time that John the Baptist and Jesus preach, preach repentance, and they try to say, repent means quit sinning, repent means quit sinning. So they say, oh, so when the Bible says repent and believe, according to them, quit sinning and then believe by faith. And so they teach that when you come to the point that you can stop sinning, then you can believe and get saved. 
I look at that and I want to laugh and cry at the same time. I've never met anyone in my life that ever made it to the point of quit sinning until they died. Then they quit sinning. But they say, well, if you, you claim to be a Christian, you say you got saved, but then you sinned, well, that proved you were never saved because you sinned. Because, see, repent means quit sinning, and you've got to quit sinning. And, believe. and that's lordship salvation. If they really believed what they claimed to believe, then guess what? The Apostle Paul's in hell right now. Because you go over to Romans chapter 7, look at what he said. Romans chapter 7. See, they're not consistent. And I've run into this so much in my ministry, these lordship salvationists, they don't even think what they're saying. And they don't define terms right. And I'm going to define repentance here in a minute of what it is. But they define it as you quit sinning. So when you quit sinning and believe, that's when you get saved, according to them. Well, they have just made it into a gospel of works plus faith. And they're lost. If they're believing in their repentance and they're trusting in their repentance and they're trusting in what they did. And many of them do. They run around and brag, I don't sin anymore. And I look at that and I go, you probably sinned this morning. <laughs> you lying devil. You might not do outward sins like uh, smoking and fornicating and, and doing horrible, but you are full of pride. That's a sin. You're full of wickedness and evil. That's a sin. Um, let's go to um, Romans chapter 7 and look at verse 17. Here's the Apostle Paul after he got saved, confessing, man, I try to do right, but I can't. Romans 7, 17 through 20. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. And then he continues on. And then he says down there a little farther, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this uh, uh, death? So the Apostle Paul says, man, I got saved by faith alone, but my whole Christian life was a struggle with sin. And I tried to do right, and I ended up falling in sin. And I didn't want to. And I feel miserable. I feel horrible. Was the Apostle Paul lost? Well, if you're a Lordship Salvationist, you have to say yes, because that's what you believe. You believe that a guy can only get saved if he quits sinning first. So they define repentance as quit sinning. Is that what repentance means? No. No, that's not what repentance means. Repentance means a change of mind. It actually has several definitions. It also can mean feeling sorry for something. You can repent after you're saved. When you sin, you repent. You feel bad about it. But it also means turning from one thing to another. In Acts chapter 20, verse 21, the Apostle Paul preaches, and he says he preached repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. And these crowd over here, your Lordship Salvation has said, so he was going around telling people to quit sinning and then believe in Jesus. <laughs> Wait, repentance toward God. Quit sinning toward God? I did, it doesn't even make sense. What was he saying? Well, you go to 1 Thessalonians 1.9. Paul said, hey, I'm so glad you all got saved because you turned from idols to God. The repentance was turning, because he's preaching to Gentiles, from their false gods to turning to the true God and tr not trusting in their false demon gods, but only trusting in the true God. So what is repentance in the Bible? Repentance is a change of mind. It's a turning from unbelief to belief. From going to hell to now you're going to heaven. But there are people out there that will take repentance and they'll try to make it a faith plus works gospel. And they try to say, no, 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 if you didn't repent, then you might have believed, but you're not saved. Because you got to repent first. So they're telling you that quitting sinning is the way you get saved. Uh, we uh, almost joined a church years ago, my wife and I, that was like that. It was a Lordship Salvation Church, and I'm so glad we didn't. God showed us some things, and we said, we're getting out of here. One of the best preachers I've ever heard, and he'd say it right sometimes, but then he'd lean toward that Lordship stuff uh, and other times. And my wife and I, we went and spent time with just about every family in that church, trying to get to know them. And they all said, well, and that's when I quit sinning, and that's when I became a Christian. And they had been taught that quit sinning, and then you believe. And then some of them, they would fall into sin, and they go, oh, I was never saved, i got to get saved all over again. Newsflash, you don't get saved over again, you only get saved once. So were they even saved? I doubt it. And I talked to a friend a couple days ago on the phone, and asked him, how's that church? And he said, well, this guy fell back in sin. This guy's an atheist now. This guy got divorced. This woman divorced her husband. This guy fell into adultery. This guy, and a lot of those people in the church, we loved them. Sweet, sweet people. 
that are living like the devil, and some of them don't even believe in God anymore. I don't believe they got saved. I believe they were taught of works plus faith gospel, and they were trusting in their repentance. And they were thinking, I'm saved because I repented. Well, what are they doing? They're saying, it's what I did that got me to salvation. And then I believed in Jesus. But, but I had to do something first. <laughs> You better watch out for anybody that preaches anything in which they say you got to do something before you can get saved or do something to stay saved. That is a false gospel and that will lead you straight into hell because the true gospel is faith alone. I remember one time in Bible school, um, this, this came up and people asked my old Bible teacher, they said, what, what about this repentance thing? What about? Because a lot of people think repentance means quit sinning. But that's not what... It is, in Paul's ministry, repentance is turning from idols to the true God. It's change of mind, uh, tr from trusting in your own righteousness to trusting in Christ's righteousness. Trusting in the blood, not in what you do. And somebody asked Dr. Ruttman, well, don't you have to repent before you can get saved? And uh, Dr. Ruttman says, well, it's like this. He says, if you are saved, you have repented. Because repent is turning. And so if you're saved, then you've turned from going to hell, now you're going to heaven. You've turned from unbelief to belief. You've turned from trusting in what you do to get to heaven to now you're trusting only in what Jesus did to get you to heaven. He said, so don't run around and worry if you repent. But there's a lot of preachers out there, they do that. They go, they go well, have you repented? Have you? They don't ask, have you believed? That's when you get saved, when you believe. They say, have you repented? And I get emails all the time from people that are sitting under lordship salvationists that say, I wonder if I repented or not. I don't know. And they're sitting out crying, I don't know if I did enough repentance or if I repented enough. Or I don't know. And I say, hey, relax. Have you trusted the gospel? Because that's when you get saved by belief. But a lot of people, they add to salvation and they try to say, well, repentance is quit sinning. So when you quit sinning, then you can get saved. And they don't understand what they're doing is they're deceiving people into thinking that salvation is by what they do, their repentance. One old preacher said one time, he said, my very repentance needs to be repented of because I'm such a sinner I can't even repent right. <laughs> I thought that was good. Why would you trust in yourself if yourself is so bad? <laughs> I'm giving up everything I ever did. I, I don't trust in what I did or didn't do. I trust in what Jesus did. That's what salvation is. Another thing people try to do is they try to say, well, you see, it's okay to believe in Jesus, and that's fine and all that, and it's great, but you've got to be baptized in water. Because unless you're baptized in water, then you're not saved. What they'll do is they'll go over to Mark chapter 16. And they'll say, now, now this verse says, which by the way, this verse is Jesus talking to Jews, okay? This isn't Paul speaking to us today. I'm going to show you that here in a second. But they say, oh, if you go to uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, why, it says you have to believe and you have to be baptized. So they say salvation is faith and this one work that you have to do of being baptized. And you say, uh, I appreciate you trying to tell me that, but that's not what the verse says. Look what it says, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they stop right there. They say, see, faith and works. Believe and get baptized in water. Well, I'm sorry, buddy, but you didn't read the next part. You stopped, and you are guilty of taking and twisting a verse out of context. You didn't read the whole verse. It says, but he that is believeth and baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So what is it that damns the person to hell? It doesn't say, but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. It doesn't say that. It says damnation is the fact that you don't believe. And what it's talking about is saying, if you believe, you'll be saved. And, you know, it's inferred there that people get saved, well, then they're going to get baptized. But it's not saying baptism saves. It even says in the very verse there, but if you don't believe, then you're damned. And I don't have time to get into it, and I wish I did, but if you do our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through Acts, you'll see there was water baptism and then there's spirit baptism. And Jesus even says in the first book of Acts, the first chapter, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So the baptism today is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and we're sealed with it when we believe. So it's not water that has anything to do with our salvation. Water baptism does not save. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You see the Apostle Paul tells us that. And the Apostle Paul says this. All right. If you believe that salvation is by water baptism and faith, you have a faith plus works gospel. And you're not saved. 
and you're not even reading the rest of the Bible. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. <laughs> Here's the Apostle Paul, and I'll, I want to make sure I read the rest, Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. See, it's the cross of Christ and what was done at the cross that saves us. And Paul says here very plainly, it's not the water. You're not saved by your water baptism. It's the cross and what was done at the cross that saves us. You can't be more clear than that. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Look at verse uh, 14. I thank God I baptized none of you, but Christmas and gave. If, if you're saved by water baptism, Paul's the worst uh, evangelist that ever lived. Because he goes, man, I thank God I didn't baptize you. I'm going to say, thank God I didn't get you saved if water baptism saves. It doesn't. It's faith. It's the gospel that saves. He says it again in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved is the power of God. So it's the preaching of the cross that saves, not the water baptism. What happened on the cross? He shed his blood. So it's the blood atonement of Christ that is salvation. Now there's other people out there that they'll say, well, that's all good, Breaker. We, we agree with you on all those points. But we believe there's something you have to do in order to be saved, and that's confession. And they'll go back to Jesus' ministry, and they'll go to Matthew 10. And they'll say, now, there's something, though, that you have to say with your mouth, otherwise you're not saved. And so, yeah, yeah, we believe, we can, we can go with you and believe it's, it's by faith, but it's also confessing. And you've got to confess with your mouth also. Okay, so it's faith and confession. You're doing it again. You're making a faith and works. You're adding to salvation, which is through faith alone. By saying, oh, it has to be through confession, too. Look at Matthew 10.32. They'll go to Matthew 10.32 and they'll say, Well, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. And they say, So see, you've got to confess with your mouth to be saved. Hey, do you know what Jesus is saying here? Do you know who he's saying here to? He's talking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, chapter 10 and verse 6. He says, don't go to the Gentiles. This is not church-age doctrine for today. This was Jesus in his earthly ministry speaking to Jews. And it's a future tribulation passage because in the tribulation they have to confess, hey, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. I don't believe that other guy, the Antichrist, who claims to be the Messiah. Now, there are some within even the independent Baptist movement, which I'm from. I'm an ordained independent Baptist. And they say, well, Breaker, you know, we believe you're saved by faith. But then they say, but confession, you've got to confess your sins to be forgiven. So to them, you're not forgiven by faith alone through the blood of Jesus. You're only forgiven to a point. And then every time you sin, well, you've got to confess it to get more forgiveness. And they get this from 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And they say, See, see, once you're saved, you're only saved for all the sins past. Now you've got to confess. And every time you confess, why well, then you get forgiveness. So salvation is based upon your confession? Well, that sounds kind of Catholic to me. It seems to me, I remember, um, the Catholic Church tells you, hey, if you'll come and confess your sins to a priest, well, he'll give you forgiveness. No, no, that's not, that's not what the Bible says. Matter of fact, um, Jesus forgave a man's sin here on earth. And the Pharisees didn't know he was God. They thought he was just a man. They said, who can forgive sins but God alone? How can a man forgive another man's sins? Catholicism teaches, well, if you go to confession, you can get your sins forgiven. Well, that's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is not saying that salvation is by faith plus confession, and whenever you confess, then your sins are forgiven. Matter of fact, it says in verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. And what is the context? Fellowship. When we're saved, we confess our sins to God and say, Lord, I did this and I'm sorry. I mean, to have fellowship, continue our fellowship with Him. But we don't lose our salvation. We don't get to heaven and God goes, well, go to hell. You believed in me, but you didn't confess this, 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 and this, so go to hell. That's not how it works. Matter of fact, look at 1 John 2 and verse 12, I believe it is. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Now go to Colossians 2.13. Colossians 2.13 says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So all my sins, all trespasses are forgiven. 
through the blood of Christ. But I've met people that teach, well, you, you've got you've to ask God to forgive your sins, and you've got to confess your sins for forgiveness. Well, then why did Jesus die then? Why didn't he just stay in heaven and say, well, if you just ask me to forgive you, I'll forgive you. He didn't do that. So there are people that will take, and they'll just, they can't help but try to add to the gospel. Confession doesn't save us. Confession doesn't keep us saved. Confession isn't what gives us our forgiveness. Now, let's go over to Romans chapter 10. I ran into this before. I actually had to leave a church because of this. Because uh, someone at that church said, I believe that confession saves you. And they got that from Romans chapter 10. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, we read, and this is where they get it from, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that's Romans 10, 9, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And they say, so the very moment you confess with your mouth and say, I believe, then you're mystically sealed and saved. Based upon your speaking, based upon what you said, and that's what they say. It's through your speaking with your mouth. Well, when you come across such people, all you have to do is go, Oh, oh, so that's the gospel? It's faith and words that you say? Faith and speak? Oh, okay. And you say, Okay, I got a question. What if a guy is born mute? What if a guy is born without a tongue? Or what if a guy is born and he's unable to speak? He just can never learn how to speak. He can hear, but he can't speak poor guy, he's going straight to hell. He can never be saved because he can't confess. So I guess he's going to burn forever. I guess God from foundation of the world said that guy can never be saved because he can't confess. Is that what the Bible is saying here in Romans 10? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe? No. Confession is what you do when something has happened. All right. If I went out, God forbid, and killed five people, it takes the cops 10 years to find me. And the cops say, did you do this? And I say, okay, I confess. Did I just do it right then? No, it was done 10 years ago. <laughs> Confession comes after what takes place. So what this is saying here, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord and believe in thy heart. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. We get imputed righteousness when we believe. And confession is made unto salvation. To the salvation that you have, when you believe, then you will confess, hey, I've believed. It's not getting you saved or keeping you saved. It's because you have gotten saved by faith, then you confess and say, hey, I'm saved. Let me prove that to you. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But I've seen people messed up thinking that salvation was through confessing. And I've even talked to people who say, Brother Breaker, I confess every night, and I say, oh God, I'm sorry, and I repeat the sinner's prayer, and I, I do everything I can, and I just keep begging God for salvation. I say, well, you ever believe the gospel? Gospel? What's that? They never even heard the gospel, so they're not trusting in that. They're trusting in their confession or in their speaking. And they're lost. Because someone deceived them into thinking it's by faith and confession. That's adding to salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter... 4 verse 13. Look at this. We have the same spirit of faith. Paul is speaking. According as it is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. So when you believe, then you'll confess. Yeah, man, I'm saved. I believe. <laughs> it's not the actual confession itself that saves you. It's whether or not you believe. But there are people out there that are so wrong in their doctrine that they will try to make you think that confession is a part of salvation, and they say, well, if you never confess, then you aren't saved. So salvation now is by what you say with your mouth? We just looked at all the verses of Paul where he says, no, it's by faith alone. So they're adding to salvation. Here's another one, and I, I, this is one of my pet peeves. I despise this, and yet this is all over modern Christianity. And this is asking Jesus into your heart. Asking or inviting Jesus into your heart. Now, before I was saved, uh, I was in a lot of different kind of churches, but mostly Southern Baptists. And most of your Southern Baptist churches, and even in your Pentecostals, 
They say, oh, you want to get saved? Just ask Jesus in your heart. Just ask Jesus to come in your heart. Just say, oh, Jesus, I invite you. Come on into my heart. Do you know there's not one verse of Scripture anywhere in the entire Bible that says, ask Jesus in your heart? So why does modern Christianity teach that? Where does that come from? Ask Jesus in your heart. I hate that. That is so just disgusting to me to hear someone say, just ask Jesus in your heart. Because that is not Bible. That is not Scripture. That is a modernistic New Age gospel. And where does it come from? Well, I've tried to figure out where it comes from. It doesn't come from the Bible, but I've traced it back to the Catholic Church. And they used to have this teaching of the sacred heart of Jesus. And ask Jesus to come in. And, and a lot of times they'd say, ask Mary to come in too. And so if you claim to be a Bible-believing Christian, and you're telling people, just ask Jesus in your heart, you don't have the true gospel. That's not salvation. And a lot of people, they'll ask Jesus in their heart, but they're not trusting in Jesus for salvation. That's my testimony. Well, there's a lot of people that believe the truth. Here's a book, Seven Reasons Not to Ask Jesus in Your Heart, Clarifying the Condition of Salvation. It's put out by the Duluth Bible Church. Phone number is 218-724-5914. It is www.duluthbible.org. Get a copy of this. I think they'll send them to you for free. Seven Reasons Why Not to Ask Jesus in Your Heart. You know why? Because it's not in the Bible. Here's another book. Stop asking Jesus into your heart. I actually found this at a gas station. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's interesting. And a lot of people are starting to wake up to the fact that you're not saved by asking Jesus in your heart. But why, all over Christianity, is that what they tell you? Most of your so-called wishy-washy, watered-down, uh, so-called Christians that don't know anything will say, oh, you want to get saved? Uh, just ask Jesus in your heart. That's what so many people are saying today, and that's not salvation. I got a uh, letter here from my old pastor, Dr. Peter Ruckman. And I don't know if I should say this, but I'm, I'm going to, all right? My dad, when he was in Bible school back in the 80s, he listened to Dr. Peter Ruckman preach. And Dr. Peter Ruckman preached hard on the blood atonement of Christ back then. But as he got older, he didn't preach as much as he used to. And a lot of people would come out of his church uh, and even out of his school. I graduated from his school. And they would go around and tell people, now just ask Jesus in your heart. The guy that Ruckman said was the greatest evangelist to ever come out of his school. That's what he tells people. I dealt with the man. I, I went to a meeting with the man. I talked to the man. I could go into that, but I won't. But I heard that man telling people, you want to get saved? Just ask Jesus in your heart. When I heard that, I said, nope, nope, nope. That, that is wrong. That's not in the Bible. Well, my dad wrote this letter on August 25th, 1993 to Peter Ruckman. And he said, Peter Ruckman, um, I've run into a bunch of people that have graduated from your school lately. This is way back in 1993. And they're not preaching the blood of Christ for salvation like you taught me when I was in school there. They're going around just asking people to ask Jesus in their heart. He said, Ruckman, you used to preach against that. What do you? And this, this letter to my dad, now I've, I'm not going to read it. I've read this in some other um, of my videos. I think Asking versus Trusting. You can look that up on YouTube and you can read this for yourself. But Ruckman says, no, no, I, I don't tell people you ask Jesus in your heart. That's not right. And this, this is, so I said that because I still run into people that, that have gone to my Bible school, that claim to be Christians, that love to go soul winning. And rather than preaching Romans 3.25 and 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, while they preach, just ask Jesus in your heart. <laughs> and I look at that and I go, no, that ain't right. You are not getting people saved. You're deceiving people. My testimony is, as a kid, that's all I heard. So every night from age 13 to 18, I said, Oh, Jesus, please come in my heart. Oh, Jesus, please come in my heart. Oh, come into my heart, please. And I go to sleep crying every night, trying to invite Jesus into my heart. Why wasn't I saved? Because no one preached the gospel to me. They told me that instead of the gospel. What do they do? They added to the gospel saying that you have to do this to be saved. And that's not salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, ask Jesus into your heart. A lot of them like to go to Re Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And they say, oh, that's Jesus knocking on your heart's door. Heart's door? There's no door to your heart. That's talking to a church. Jesus is outside of the church going, hey, there's a lot of lost people in there. Why don't they come out here and get saved? So asking Jesus or inviting Jesus into your heart or your life, that's, that's not Bible. That is Billy Graham made up milk sop Christianity and it's a lie. And let me tell you the damage that it can do. While I was in Bible school, I met a man who, uh, who went to Bible school there. 
Yeah, he used to be a practicing witch before he uh, came to Christ. And uh, I asked him, I said, um, well, I just have a couple questions for you. I said, I hear Christians all the time going around saying, just ask Jesus in your heart, just ask Jesus in your heart. And I said, I don't find that in the Bible. And I said, it, it worries me because that's not the gospel. So let me ask you a couple questions. I said, number one, and I said, I don't know why I'm thinking this, but it just popped in my head. Are there any demons named Jesus? And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, when I was a practicing witch, I, I met a lot of demons and they all said, call me Jesus. And I said, well, the Bible in the, in, in the scriptures talks about one cometh unto you teaching another Jesus. I said, that's interesting. I said, what do demons hate? He goes, well, they hate the blood of Christ. He said, if you mention the blood of Jesus, they run. They hate the gospel. I said, okay. I said, let me ask you one more question. You dealt with demons as a witch. He said, I did. I said, how do you get a demon? He said, you have to ask for it. I said, you, you ask for a demon? Yeah, you ask it to come inside your heart or come inside of you. I said, oh, okay, so... I started putting two and two together, and I thought to myself, oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. What is happening in the world today? A lot of people running around claiming to be Christians, and they don't preach the gospel of salvation. They're preaching a works gospel, and they're telling people, hey, man, you want to get saved? Just ask Jesus in your heart. And the guy goes, oh, Jesus, come in my heart. How do you know they didn't just get a demon into their heart? There's a lot of demons who call themselves Jesus, and they're waiting to be invited in. And if you're not preaching the gospel of salvation through the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, instead of soul winning, you might be soul damning people and getting another Jesus inside of them. And I've met a lot of people that claim to be Christians, and I don't think they're saved. And it's obvious they have a demon. Very obvious. I've run into uh, missionaries whose wives had demons. I've run into pastors, pastors' wives. And they say, oh, i got a demon. I got." And I'm thinking, well, if you're saved, you can't have a demon. If the Bible says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise when you're saved, how can a demon come in and break that seal? Is a demon more powerful than God? No. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you. A demon can't come in. But if you get a demon, it's because you were never saved. And you did that instead of believing in faith alone in the blood atonement of Christ. A lot more I'd like to say. The Bible talks about salvation by grace through faith. Romans 3.25 says, through faith in the blood. That's why I preach the message of trusting and faith in the blood of Jesus. And I do my absolute best to take them to as many verses on the blood of Jesus to try to win somebody to the Lord. Take them to 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. I don't want to give them a message of, well, salvation by faith. Now you just believe Jesus and now ask him into your heart. And then not mention the blood or the gospel. Because they might think, oh, well, all right, by the asking is how I'm saved. And then they'll believe, I'm saved because I ask. You know how many people I've run into? And I say, hey, what's your testimony of salvation? They say, well, I'm saved because I asked Jesus to save me. And you know what's worse? Mo many of them say this. But there was a time in my life afterwards where I didn't feel saved, so I just asked them again. So they're trusting in their asking rather than the atonement of Christ. And it didn't work the first time, so they go do it again. Well, if it didn't save you the first time, why do you think you got saved the second time? Are you even saved? Or might you have a demon inside of you trying to convince you that you're saved when you're not? Scary stuff, man. Scary stuff. Last thing I want to say, and I want to make this very plain, I'm not against Romans 10, 13. But what I am very sad to see is people taking Romans 10, 13 and preaching it out of context and preaching it instead of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. A lot of people today will go to Romans 10, 13, and they'll say, Now, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you want to be saved, just call on the Lord. And they won't explain what that means, and they won't give you the gospel, and they won't read the context of Romans 10, 13. Now, my testimony is, since I was a little kid, I would read Chick Tracks from about the age of 13 all the way up to 18. And in the end, they say, Now, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So every night, I'd get down by my bed and say, Oh, God, please save me. I'm asking you to come in my heart. Please. And I did that from age 13 to 18. And I wasn't saved. This is all that I'd heard. And I was thinking that that saved me. So I kept doing it over and over and over. And I didn't get saved. No one explained to me what the Bible means by calling upon the name of the Lord. Let's go to Romans 10, 13. There's a way to call upon the Lord correctly. And then there's the wrong way. 
Matter of fact, there's a certain song in the hymn book. I got it written down over there someplace. But there's a song in our hymn book that we sang just the other day in church. And it says, call upon the Lord, but don't call in vain or you'll be damned. Or something to that effect. Even the hymn book says you can call on the Lord and still not be saved. But the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. So how is it that a person can call on the Lord and still be lost if the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the Lord? Because there's the right way to call and the wrong way to call. If you call from the mouth only, then you're lost. But if you call by faith from the heart, then you're saved. Let's look at the context. Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 6. And you see, what a lot of people do is they say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. So they say, what that means is, with your mouth, just say, oh God, save me. And so they say that salvation is by the mouth. That doesn't make sense. God is dealing with your heart. And to God, it's a heart matter. God wants to know what's in your heart. And God is looking at your heart to see if you believe or not. Look at this, verse 6. Romans chapter 10 and verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So faith speaks to God. From where? Where does faith cry out and speak to God from? The righteous which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart. <laughs> so your heart speaks to God. Salvation is a heart issue and a heart matter. And it's coming to God and it's from the heart crying out to God for salvation by faith in the blood. If all you do is come to God and say, God, I don't want to go to hell. Please save me and you're not trusting in the blood, then you've called with the mouth, but not from the heart. And this thing here that I wanted to show you, this Peter Ruckman letter, he says that down here a little bit later. And he calls it cashing in. Now man can ask Jesus Christ to save him, and then months later or years later, the Lord may cash in and bring the man to the point of salvation because he asked. But why? It's because later he brought him the gospel to believe. So even Ruckman said, if all a guy does was call upon the Lord with the mouth but he's not trusting in the atonement of Christ from the heart, he's not saved. But today, even in the independent Baptist, what I'm in, I don't see people explaining that. They run around and say, hey man, you want to go to heaven? Just say, oh God, I'm a sinner, save me. Oh God, I'm a sinner. Hey, you're saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now I come along later, and I try to witness to that guy, and the guy goes, I'm saved because Pastor so-and-so said so. I said, really? What's your testimony? Well, I just said, oh God, save me. I said, what? Yeah, okay, all right. But... What, have you ever heard the gospel? What's the gospel? Well, let me explain it to you. 1 Corinthians 51 to 4. Are you trusting in the blood of Christ? Blood of Christ? What's that? See, what they did is they got someone with the mouth to say something, but the person is not believing from the heart because they haven't been taught what the Bible says you're supposed to believe in to be saved. And to me, that's atrocious. That's horrible. That's awful. Let's read uh, verse 8. Romans 10, 8. But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith. <laughs> you can say something with your mouth and not believe in your heart. And that's what happens all too often. Romans 10, 13. Hey, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the sinner goes, well, God save me. All right, you're saved. But that person has never heard the gospel and never trusted in the blood of Christ. Are they saved? No. Why? Because they're thinking that the calling saved them. If salvation was by just saying, oh God, save me, then why did Jesus die? He could have stayed up in heaven and said, you know what, new dispensation, let me see, who's the guy out there I like? Well, you know what, Jesus showed up and he really liked this guy named Nathaniel. He says, wow, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. God could have just stayed up in heaven and Jesus said, hey Nathaniel, come over here Nathaniel, you're my new prophet. Now just go around and tell everybody, if they'll just ask me for salvation, I'll save them. And God could have done that and that could have been the new dispensation. Just ask God to save you. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus came, he lived 33 years under the law, and he proved that he was sinless. And then he shed his blood and he died for the sins of the world. Then he went back up to heaven and he calls the world. And he calls to them and he says, Come to me for salvation. Come to my blood. Trust my blood for the forgiveness of sins. If all you've ever done was call with the mouth, you're still lost. You've got a call from the heart through faith, because the righteous which is of faith speaketh the word of faith in your heart. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's a heart thing. And I've met ton of Christians 
who have done the Romans 10, 13 thing and called upon God with the mouth only and said, oh, God, save me. Many of them say, I don't know if I'm saved, so I do it every night before bed. But they're not believing from the heart. Someone didn't explain the gospel to them. Look at verse um, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? You see, if you call without believing, you're not saved. That's all I'm trying to say. And yet people will take salvation by faith and they'll say, well, it's okay to believe, but you've got to call with your mouth. And so they're adding to salvation and saying calling is a part of salvation. Well, if you make it the mouth, then you're making it a work. And you're saying you have to say something to be saved. But the only thing you can do that's not a work is believe. So if calling upon the name of the Lord is a heart thing, which it looks like in the context here, then that's not a work. But there are people out there that try to make you think, no, you got to do it. you got to say it with your mouth. I've met people who said, you know what, I never said anything with my mouth. When I heard the gospel, I understood and I believed. And I got saved. Didn't ever say anything vocally with their mouth. They just believed from the heart. Are they saved? Oh, yeah, because with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. That's what the Bible says. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, guess what it says? They that call upon the Lord of a pure heart. So calling upon the Lord biblically is from the heart believing in the blood atonement of Christ. And you're either saved by that or you're not. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 13. Let's go to Matthew 10, or Matthew uh, 15, 8. Let me show you something. Maybe some people haven't thought about. But if this is true, and it is, there are a lot of churches out there that are full of lost people that have done one of these things or is trusting in one of these things. They're thinking, I'm saved because I'm keeping the law. They're lost. They're thinking, well, I do good work, so I must be saved. They're lost because they're not trusting faith alone in Christ. They think, well, I repented because uh, because I repented, I quit sinning. Well, I'm saved because I'm not sinning anymore. They're lost. Well, I, I got baptized in water. And if they're trusting in their water baptism, they're lost. Oh, I, I confess Jesus, and I confess him every day. I go around and tell everyone, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. And they're thinking, that'll get them to heaven, but they're not trusting in what Jesus did. They're lost. People out there think, well, I'm saved because I invited Jesus into my life. <laughs> I, I asked him into my heart. If you're trusting in that rather than the blood of Christ, you're lost. If you're thinking that you're saved by your calling with your mouth only and not faith from the heart, you're lost. Look at what Jesus says. This is Jesus. You want to argue? You want to argue with Jesus, do you? You see, there are a lot of people out there that want to argue about this. I don't want to argue. I just want you to see what the Bible says, and I don't want you to add something to salvation. I want you to see what salvation is. It's faith alone in the finished work of Christ. But in Matthew 15, 8, Jesus says, well, actually, in verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy to you, saying, Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees, the lost religious people of his day who thought that their works saved them. And he says in verse 8, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They've called on God every time they pray, Oh, Jehovah God of the Lord of the Old Testament, Baruch Hashem Adonai, you know, Baruch Atai Hashem Adonai, or whatever it is they say in Jew, the Jews in Hebrew. Oh, we come to you, Jesus, and we call on you with our mouth. And in their heart, they're just like, I can't wait for this service to be over. I'm going to go rob that or, uh, orphan, and I'm going to go take all that money that widow has. And, and that's what Jesus told us, how evil they were in their heart. Their heart was far from God. All they did was come to God with their mouth, but they didn't believe from the heart. When I try to win people to Jesus, I try to make it a heart thing. I try to point him to the crucified Christ and try to look and see if there's any signs in that person of understanding. Because you're not saved until you hear the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and understand. Let me show you that. Matthew 13, 15. Matthew 13, 15, Jesus says, For this people's heart is wax gross. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest that at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, should understand with their heart, and should be converted. No conversion, Jesus says, unless you hear something first, and then understand. What is it that today you have to hear and understand in order to be saved? The gospel. And when you hear the gospel preached, and you understand, Oh, it's what Jesus did that saves me, not my works. 
And not Jesus plus something else. It's Jesus alone. When you understand that and you believe, that's when you're saved. But a lot of people are over here thinking, well, I asked him to come in and I, I cried, oh God, save me. And I confess him all the time and I got water baptized and I, I repent every day and I do good works and I, I'm even going back to the law trying to do good because I just want God to accept me. Is that a saved person? If they're trusting in something they do or they said, rather than solely trusting in what Jesus did? No, that's a lost person. And that's what's so shameful to me, is that there's men out there that claim to be preachers and ministers of the gospel, and they're not even preaching the gospel. And they're up there in the pulpit talking about every other thing in the world, but the thing that's most important, Christ died for your sins in your place. Trust His blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Come to Him alone for salvation in His finished work. I'm going to close with Philippians 1.27. When I preach like this, usually I get more and more people saying, I got saved, you made it clear to me. And I think that's wonderful. But also I get attacked. Because people on this side that are lost. You see, religious people are angry people and hateful. The religious crowd, the Pharisees, killed Jesus. Why? Why did they hate Jesus so much and want to kill Him? Because He said, you're lost. And your works are no good. You need to come to me for salvation. Oh, when you're a self-righteous Pharisee and full of pride, you don't want to hear that. Because basically what they heard Jesus saying was, you're evil and wicked and ungodly. And they're like, I don't want to hear that because I'm a good person and I'm going to get to heaven based upon what I do. But, but basically that's the message of Jesus. You're a wicked, filthy, ungodly person and you need to get saved. Now come to Jesus for salvation. Well, who wants to admit that they were wrong? Who wants to see themselves as they really are? A lot of people want to think they're saved based upon what they do. So let's close with Philippians 1.27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. If you're one of my viewers and you got saved through my ministry, let's stand together in the faith of the gospel. And let's stand against those that add to salvation. But here's what we need to do. Verse 28, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Don't be afraid of these people that talk against us. The more I preach the gospel, the more people on YouTube are going to make videos against me. And we know who they are. They're this crowd that's lost. And it's sad which is of them an evident token of perdition. The reason they're so vocal and crying against the true gospel is because they're lost. Perdition means they're damned. They're going to hell. But to you of salvation and that of God. Let me continue. Verse 29. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, because we're saved by faith only believing, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. So I just want to preach the gospel, preach it plain, preach it right, preach it clear. And the gospel is all about salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Coming to Christ for salvation, not trusting in what you did, trusting solely, completely in what Jesus did for you. That's what the Bible says. Don't get on this side and think that it's your works that save you, because they will never save you. And don't get on this side and think, oh, well, you know, I can believe in Jesus and have faith in, in some of the things the Bible says, but, oh, i got to do works or I'll lose it. You're still saying, no, it's on me. See, both of these sides put the focus on them and try to make them sinners into good. But they're still sinners. And where do sinners go? Hell. You need to give up trusting in what you do and come only to Christ because he did everything to die on the cross and pay for your sins. And you need to trust in Him alone for salvation. I don't add to salvation. Never have, never will. I try to give you the simplicity of the gospel. And it's so simple. It's all what Jesus did. Now just come to Him for salvation and allow Him to save you. Quit trying to save yourself. Well, I went a little long, but I had to. I hope this has been a blessing. We'll see you next time. God bless.